Father in heaven, <clears throat> we pray for your servants that are being unjustly held right now. And we pray that there will be a good resolution to this situation very soon and that they will be restored primarily to their family but also to us and to the good work that they're doing in your name. May your, may your spirit be with them now to give them courage in this time. And please note the prayers of your people around the world on behalf of this family. Now, Lord, as we turn to your word today, speak to us. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So December 26, always kind of, a, uh, kind of an awkward day for a Sabbath. Are we still doing Christmas? Did that end yesterday? Where are we on all of that? If it's a little later in the week, it's easy enough. Obviously, we're talking about going into the new year. If it's, if it's before or Christmas Day, it's obvious enough. What do you do on the day after? So I wondered, as I thought about that, I thought about Mary and Joseph on the day after. What was it like the day after Jesus was born? You know, sometimes uh, an event takes place and, and then there's all of this uh, amazing ceremony associated with it. I mean, nobody was expecting shepherds to show up that night, and there they were. What does that cause you to think the next day is going to be like? Now, of course, in our telling of the story, we like to have the shepherds and the wise men all show up at the same time, and that probably isn't how it works, since, since one account talks about that night, and then the account in Matthew of the of the wise men actually says they came to the house where Jesus was staying. So I don't know exactly what the timing of that was, but, but you have this, this announcement, the shepherds come, and this, the wise men come, and then the next day. It's kind of hard to go on with the next day when, when something amazing had happened and you have these expectations of what's going to happen. And then, then a day turns into a month, turns into a year, turns into years. And it seems like the promise is not being fulfilled. What do you think those shepherds thought? In fact, how many of those shepherds do you think were still alive? when Jesus finally appeared at the bank of the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist some 30 years later? I don't know. Probably the wise men were no longer around. What did they think? Did they think, wow, that was sure a weird thing we did. I haven't heard a thing about that since that happened. What happens on the days after? I want to spend some time today in a passage that's quite well known. It's John chapter 3. But before we get there, I want to start in chapter 1 again. We've read some of these words uh, this particular Christmas season, but I want to read it again. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. I want to talk about the light today. That life was the light of all mankind. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then verse 9, the true light, 
that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. So, so what happened the day after the light of heaven came into the world? But it was such a small light, it seemed. Who could believe that the light that this baby was, this Christ child, would be a light that would one day fill the world. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. It was hard to recognize because sometimes the great works of God, the light from heaven, comes in a way we don't expect. You know, it's a wonderful thing to know lots of stuff. It's a wonderful thing to have a heritage of faith. It's a wonderful thing to have been told the wise thoughts and the musings of generations before. But sometimes there's a danger in that. And that is that when things don't happen quite the way we expect, it makes us incapable of seeing the light for what it is. And John 3 tells that exact story of a man who knows many great things, but yet he's confronted with the light of heaven and he doesn't know what to do with it. It's, of course, the story of Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He was an important person. He came to Jesus at night. Now, I want to pause there for just a second, because there's, I think kind of a double meaning here. I think, first of all, is the obvious blatant meaning. He came to Jesus in the darkness of night because probably he didn't want anybody else important to know he was talking to Jesus. He just kind of slipped in under the cover of darkness. And, and, and think about it for a minute. When is it we do those things that we're not sure are the right thing to do? We do them at night under the cover of darkness. I don't want to be seen. Now in this case, he was doing the right thing. Too often in our own, it's the other way. But he came to Jesus at night. But I want to go another step with this because Jesus was the light that had come into the world. And here's Nicodemus who represents everything supposedly figured out, set in place, laid down. We know what to expect. We know how to live. We know what to believe. We know what to do. Yet the truth is that was not the light. Jesus was the light. And because he knew everything, yet he had encountered what he didn't expect, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Okay, so it's kind of a statement of faith. He's like, I got some dissonance here. You're doing these kinds of things that I would expect only could come from God. But who are you? And where did you come from? Because you're not doing it the way we do it. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Well, it seems kind of a strange response. He starts by saying, you must be from God because you're doing good stuff. But then Jesus goes another way, seemingly another way with it. He's going to bring it together, but he seems to go another way with it. He's like, yeah, you've got to be born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. 
Now, I don't know exactly what his tone there was. I mean, maybe it could have been a little sarcastic even. I don't know. Could have been he really was trying to understand what was going on. After all, let's, let's give him a break on this account. We've heard the phrase, be born again, our whole lives. That was kind of the first time he was hearing that. So maybe we can't blame him too much for going literal with it. But clearly that's not what Jesus has in mind. Verse 5, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Now there's a couple ways to see this passage. And, and one of those ways, to be born of water and Spirit, I think goes really well with what we saw today, with the baptism we saw today, of being born again through the baptism in the water. And while I think that's valid, I, I think this passage itself is actually stating something slightly different than that. The water is, in fact, the experience where we enter into that new birth. But I think technically what he's saying here, he, he explains in the second, in verse 6, he says, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. And I think what he's saying here is, is in the literal sense, when a baby is born, there is the water associated with that. There is the water of the womb in which the baby lives, and you are born first from that water, but then you must be born again by the Spirit. And that is why water of baptism is such an awesome symbol, and you come up into a new life in the Spirit. Because it is at that point when Jesus was baptized that, that Scripture says the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And Garrison, that's what we pray for you today. That as you come up out of that water, that God's Spirit comes upon you in a new way to empower you. Just as he did Jesus. But he's saying in order to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, you've got to have two things. One, you have to have been born a human. And second, you have to be born again of the Spirit of God. Now, you can be born a human. You can be trained in religion. You can learn the rules of the church. You can learn the Ten Commandments of God. You can do all of those things and yet not be born of the Spirit. And that's a cautionary tale. And it's one that Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Verse 7, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. There's a couple ways to think about the wind. One is the meteorological, scientific approach to the wind. We understand why wind happens, right? It's the unequal heating of the Earth's surface. As the sun is at a different pos relative position based on the Earth, therefore colder air establishes in the north, warmer air is created in the south. The colder air, by the nature of it, in the spin of the Earth, slips to the south, and the warmer air rises up over it, and the result is vortices which begin to spin. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Is that what Jesus is talking about? Or is he talking about the fact that we can know everything about how wind is formed, but when we walk out that door, when that gust hits us, we don't know exactly where it came from, and we don't know exactly where it went. So it is with those born of the Spirit. If we truly are to be believers who live according to the Spirit, there's going to be some adventure in that. There's going to be some unexpected in that. There's going to be times when things happen that we weren't looking for. But if we will be open to that Spirit and be those people who live by the Spirit, we will do things we never thought we would do. Peter never thought he'd go into the house of a Gentile. But the Spirit blew him through the door. Peter never thought he would baptize an uncircumcised Roman. But the Spirit fell upon them and he said, what else can I do? How can this be, Nicodemus asked. Verse 10, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. 
And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. All right, what an interesting story for Jesus to touch on. Do you remember this story, this Old Testament story? The children of Israel are in the wilderness. They're traveling. They've not gotten to Canaan yet, and, and they're complaining. Shocking news, but it was happening. They're complaining again. And as a result, serpents break out in the camp, and these are very venomous serpents, and they're biting the people. And the people, this is, these are fatal bites. It's kind of like a pandemic, if you will has broken out in the camp. And God says to Moses, I want you to make, make a serpent and, and put it on a staff and lift it up and everyone who looks upon it believing will be cured. And here Jesus is saying, just like in that story, all who looked in faith lived, so it is with the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, they didn't really understand at this point what Jesus meant by lifted up. But we know now, don't we? That when he would be lifted onto the cross to die for our sins, that all who would look on him in faith would be saved. And then comes that verse that everybody knows. In fact, say it with me, John 3, 16. We probably, most of us know it in the King James because that's how we learned things back then. But say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the great hope. This is the message. Now, now no doubt this encounter with Nicodemus probably went longer than the, than the 21 verses in which it appears in John chapter 3. But I believe that the author of John has collapsed it into the most critical pieces of this interaction. And at the heart of it sits these words. I'll read it to you again, this time in the New International Version. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is, this is what Linnell was getting at as he started this morning. This is the perfect, perfect set off for what I wanted to say to you today is that, is that in Jesus and in what he had done is light and life. He was the light who came into the world. Verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The world didn't need condemning. That was taken care of. We condemned ourselves. The world needed saving. Therefore God sent his Son into the world to save the world, and he made it available to anyone because all it took was to look and live, to believe, to see and believe. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, like I said, God didn't need to bring condemnation. It was there. It was fine. It was there. What he needed was to bring a Savior. And all you have to do to be a part of that is to believe in the Savior. But to refuse that 
No matter how hard you work at other things to refuse the salvation that God has given is to be condemned already because there is no other name given under heaven by which men can be saved. Verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Nicodemus came at night. The light of God through Jesus came into the world at night. He came to his own, but his own did not recognize him. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So here's what it means to look and believe and live. You come into the reality of Jesus, the light of the world, dying on the cross for our sins. And you stand in the presence of that light with the awareness of your part, the darkness in your own heart, the selfishness, the deeds of unkindness, the lack of love, the self-centeredness. And you stand in the presence and you must make a decision there. Do I want the light that comes from the one on the cross in me transforming me? Or do I want to slip around here into the shadow and hide? That's the moment. You see, the light has come and the light illuminates everything. All that you are, all that you've done. And it either replaces your darkness with light or you have to hide yourself from it. That's how it works. And if you decide what you want more than anything else is the light that comes from faith in Jesus, then God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's for you, if that's what you want. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. John chapter 1, verse 14, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. You see, it's all calling us to a decision. Whether we're going to put our faith and trust in the light that has come into the world or whether we're going to continue to live in the darkness. What do you want? What do you want to do? John chapter 20, verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and, the, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Do you want to have life in the name of Jesus? Or do you want to try to find life out here in the dark? Those are the options.
We've come to the end of a most remarkable year. And I have come to a conclusion in my mind. And that conclusion is this. I refuse to leave the year 2020 unchanged. I refuse to go through everything I've gone through this year and not have it change me for the better. I may be stubborn. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Amen. I may be stubborn, but I'm not hopeless. The Lord doesn't have to do more than this to get my attention. I don't know what it's going to take for you, but turning everything I thought upside down on its head, that's enough for me. That got my attention. I'm thinking back to earlier in the year, in the, back in the month of March. See, I'm, I'm a little bit old school, I think, in this regard. If it's Sabbath morning, we're having church. There you go. That's right. And back in March, at the beginning of the week, somebody came and was talking to us. I think Tim and I were talking. And somebody came in and said, well, you know, you may have to shut down church. And I think, I think we scoffed a little. Ha! Shut down church. See, the staff used to make fun of me because whenever there was a hurricane or anything like that, I'm like, as long as my car will drive to the church, I'll be there Sabbath morning. That was my rule. And then March came along, and we started the week saying, what a ridiculous suggestion that we would shut down church. And we ended the week posting little flyers on the glass door saying, in cooperation with CDC guidelines, uh, we are suspending the worship service for a short period of time. I didn't think that was possible. I didn't think we'd ever do that. But we did. And I think it was the right thing. But we thought, maybe a couple weeks. Tim and I were so sure. We're older, we know everything. The rest of the staff, just a bunch of kids. Yeah, not so much, right? Didn't go that way, did it? Suddenly all our kids were home. Nobody went back to school. My daughter, Ariel, graduated for about five months, it seems like. We celebrated her graduation so many times, it was ridiculous. <laughs> Nothing happened the way I thought it would. Everything changed. And suddenly I could no longer hang on to that notion that everything goes on the way it always has. No, it can change. Where is your confidence? Where is your trust? Where is your hope? I'll tell you something I learned this year. I learned that this is an amazing community. And that despite the fact that we weren't gathering here on a weekly basis, this church was faithful in every way, continuing to minister to one another, continuing to reach out to one another. We would have all kinds of creative events that people would participate in, and continuing to be faithful in your giving, despite the fact that we couldn't gather here week by week, yet I believe the love amongst the community for one another grew during this time, not get smaller. We began to realize that to be together was so much more precious than we realized before. We didn't take each other for granted. We were changed, but changed for the better. And now we rejoice at the chance to even have to suffer in this room in those adorable masks you're all wearing. Never thought we'd do that. What other things have you gone through this year? What other challenges have you gone, have you experienced, have you known? My challenge for you is 
Don't leave this year unchanged. Don't let this happen to you and have make no difference in your life. Don't do that. Now, I can't tell you that I know when Jesus comes again. And I can't tell you that things might not settle back more to normal in the next year. Now, we have a vaccine, and maybe six months from now we'll be gathered again, and, and we won't have our masks on, and it'll be fine. I don't know. One thing I've learned, I don't know. No promises. Except for one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that by him the world might be saved. Look, believe, and live. This last part of 2020 has been particularly challenging and poignant for our family. Things come upon us in unexpected ways at unexpected times. What have you lost this year? We experienced a very close and significant loss at the end of this year. It was late in the evening, just a little over a week ago. Alicia and I were sleeping. It was about two in the morning. Our son Aaron came into the room. And you sense when your children come in with a certain urgency in their presence that there is something and it wakes you up. And he had news for us that we didn't want to hear. And that was... The news that the brother of the girl he's been dating for several years now was on his way home that previous evening and had died in an automobile accident, 18 years old. It's not a unique story. I understand that. We, we lost a young man, Gainsley, who was a member of our church this year. You may have had similar experiences in your heart, and each of them hits in different ways and in different proximity. This one hit very close to us. And so the week of Christmas did not go the way we expected. We thought we knew what we would be doing this last week, but instead of what we thought we would do on Tuesday of last week, we got up at 4.30 in the morning and got in our car and drove to Collegedale, Tennessee to mourn with the others at a memorial service for a young man whose life was taken too soon. It's been an emotional time, but it's been a reminder and I share it with you as a reminder that we are given the moment and we are promised eternity. But we are not promised tomorrow. And even if nothing unexpected comes upon us, there still is a day. But the promise is look and live. For God so loved the world. And therefore today, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord.
all who believe, He will give eternal life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we stand at the close of this most remarkable and unexpected year, in our varying experiences of elation and despair, in our hopes and in our fears, in our sicknesses and in our health, we stand, each one right now, in front of the light of the world, Jesus Christ, who for our lives went to the cross that we might be saved. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And Jesus was lifted up, and we've been drawn. And here we are, standing before his cross right now, with the light of heaven shining on our lives, seeing every reality of ourselves. And some of it makes us want to hide behind the pew or the couch if we're at home. But he says, come to me that you might live. And we say right now, Lord Jesus, look upon us in mercy and grace and save us in your eternal kingdom. We want you, the light of the world, to be born in our hearts today. In Jesus' name. Amen.